Um, as you have seen, in, if you have been here in the past two days, you have seen some sequence about what, what genomics are and from Bruce Albert's talk, the discovery of DNA polymerase and the following discoveries that, that led us where we are now. Uh, so we're going to take about the, what happened after the year 2000 with, with the explosion of high throughput sequencing and, and what happened after that, the new, the new type of uh, eyes that we look at nature with. I also would like to, to take a, a minute to thank the, organizer, the organizers one more time and uh, many people have praised the leadership of the library yesterday for many reasons. I, I want to add one extra reason is the excellent staff that they have recruited and trained. It's really impressive how I've been to BioVision Alexandria in 2010 and this year and many of you especially who have worked in Egyptian institutions would see that it, it's really uh, impressive to see the highly trained staff and uh, highly educated as well working on every aspect of the program. And from here I would like to, to move to the sessions topic. I'd like first to acknowledge Professor Ahmed Atiyah who will be the rapporteur of this session. He's the Vice Dean of the Institute of Graduate Studies and Research and Department, uh, Department of Environmental Studies in the Alexandria University. Um, and we have three speakers representing three different aspects of the metagenomics and then at the end I will do a little piece as well. My name is Rami Aziz. I'm an assistant professor of microbiology and immunology at Cairo University and I have been in San Diego for the past three years visiting the lab of Dr. Rob Edwards at San Diego State University and also lately in the University of California at San Diego. And I will introduce our, our uh, speakers one by one as they start their, their talks and we would like to take questions after each talk so that it's fresh in your minds. Unlike the past sessions, I think it's better to have the questions after each talk. So I'll just give a very, very small introduction of the field and then we will move to our speakers. Microbiology is surprisingly a very new field. It's, it's almost three centuries old. It, it started with the ability to see whatever we don't see, unlike other fields of biology. And that dates to the invention of the microscope and the culture techniques developed by Koch and Pasteur. But there has been really a couple of revolutions in microbiology since it started and I believe that we are in the third, the third revolution with the metagenomics field. As you know, microbes are everywhere, anywhere, hot, hot lakes or uh, fountains, Antarctic, freezing, deep ocean, everywhere you can find microbes where no other life can exist. And biology has a very unique characteristic of very, very high diversity. However, there is a unity in all this diversity. As you can see, what, there is a common thing between all what you see here, from humans to E. coli to archaea, which is the central metabolic pathways. This is a map. You're not supposed to really see any detail here, but it's, it represents the vast aspects of the central metabolism. And it's all, it all has some common pathways, as you know, in the sugar metabolism or in the generation of energy through ATP. Maybe only viruses, as I will discuss in the last talk, are different. So in summary, we have about 10 to the power of 30 prokaryotes on Earth. And these have been very, very understudied until very recently. This, that's a number I cannot really read. If you put 30 zeros, I mean, it's, it's really hard to, to comprehend. And most of these have not been cultured, but in the past three centuries, we have almost been focusing on two types of, well, on all bacteria that, or archaea that you can culture, but also those of human interest. We have been very, very anthropocentric in our studies. Whatever causes human disease or whatever gives humans some products like cheese, yogurt, or wine, that was the, the interest of humanity until very recently. And, and now we discover that there is a lot of diversity that has not been studied. So the question here, I mean, th there is classical ways of studying diversity by microscopy or by different culture, culture methods. But the new way we're looking at is metagenomics to better understand that diversity. So I will really very briefly introduce metagenomics because I know each of the speakers will, will give you a little bit more. As I told you, I believe it's the third golden age of microbiology. The first is claimed to be the discovery of antibiotics. The second is the DNA discovery and all the molecular techniques. 
I believe metagenomics has given us a similar evolution as the discovery of the microscope. Just as soon as we, we started being able to read DNA directly without culture and not just the 16S, the ribosomal DNA, but everything, we have seen many, many new things that we didn't know. And the technique is really simple, and I'm sure the speakers will talk more. You, you just, you know that there are many genomes, bacteria, viruses, archaea, um, and small eukaryotes as well. They are not seen, but you, once you break them apart, you can sequence the DNA now, and we have techniques to be able to reassemble that, try to figure out the taxonomic, who is there, and what they are doing, the functional aspects. And it's very similar to reconstructing old manuscripts, which we're very familiar with in Egypt. You just look at an old fragments and you try to bring them together. Some of the fragments are 10 copies and some of them are one copy and some of them are not existent and you try to, to guess what they were. So basically, I would like to just conclude this with a little comparison between metagenomics and genomics because it's really a little bit of a different concept. In genomics, you try to, you assume that any genome sequence you try to achieve is from one organism. So you really want to reach all the sequence. You want to sequence and cover every part of that genome so that you know what the organism does. So basically, you're trying to reconcile differences in genomics. Any difference you try to, as much as you can, to ignore in, during the assembly, unless it's very well documented single nucleotide polymorphisms, and you construct metabolism from that. But metagenomics, every sequence counts. Every piece of DNA that you sequence after filtering any noise or contamination. You try to guess from there what the microbial and viral communities are like. And the differences between reads count. And you try to count every read. If you have 10,000 copies of, a thing, of one particular piece of DNA, you try to, uh, with small differences, you guess from that that this is high abundant organism. Again, the three major questions are who is there, how many, and what do they do? And part of the metagenomics is also the, the human associated metagenome or the human microbiome, which you have heard a lot about lately. So uh, from here, I will move to, to our speakers, starting from the earth microbiome with Dr. Gilbert, and then to the a little bit specific microbiome of the Red Sea, and then more computational aspect. So I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jack Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert is currently in, is currently in the Argonne National Lab. He got his PhD from Nottingham University in the UK and then moved to Canada. And then he is currently the senior environmental microbiologist at the Argonne National Lab, but he has another half dozen affiliations. Uh, among which he is also affiliated with the University of Chicago. He is fellow of the Institute of Genomics and Systems Biology, the Department of Mathematics and Computational Sciences. He is also a co-founder and a co-leader of the Earth Microbiome Project, um, an editor in half a dozen journals, including PLOS One and the ISME Journal. And one thing you don't know about Dr. Gilbert is he's a really great singer. And uh, if you have a chance, you will listen to him. <laughs> Please, Dr. Gilbert. Um, we are in the third golden age of microbiology, but we're also in an incredibly exciting time for anybody that wants to study biology. Biology is really taking new leaps forward in its ability to interrogate this planet we live on. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the disparity in funding between astronomy and space exploration and our own investigation of the planet which we call home. Um, and as part of that, I've started basically putting microbiome project at the end of anything I'm particularly interested in. So we started off with the human microbiome project and now we have the earth microbiome project. But I challenge anybody, if you're interested in the bacteria living in an environment, we could do the tissue microbiome project. That'd be cool. Or, or, the, uh, or, the, or the computer microbiome project. That would be, these, are, these are ways of investigating the environments, and as Ramey said, they live everywhere that microbes inhabit. Now, one of this, this comes down to a, a CERN Institute, uh, which is based in Switzerland, but um, uh, is under, underneath most of Europe, um, uh, has billions 
if not um, uh, closing in on trillions over a, a long period of time, dollars in funding. Billions and billions of dollars in funding. Now, uh, they, ha they did this on one central tenet. They went to governments around the world and they sold them this particular particle, the Higgs boson particle. And they said, if you give us $600 billion, we will find the God particle. Uh, however much heresy that is, they're trying to say that we will find the particle which will bind together u the unified theory of physics. Now, I challenge anybody in this room to try and come up with a theory of, of biology which could challenge the Higgs boson particle. How would we do that? Recently, and this was my, my poll, I, I put in the shadow biosphere. I said if we could, if we could classify the unknown biology on this planet, the majority of which, 99% of which is bacterial, then we could really start to investigate the world. Other people said life on other planets. So you found life on other planets, that's, that's, not a, that's not really a useful one. And the origin of life, which is very, very difficult to understand and probably unknowable. So I would say, I would say you know, even though I got the least votes, I would say the shadow biosphere is the most important. Um, but this is, this is a very interesting thing to actually think about. You know, how do we channel more money into understanding biological, bi the biology of our planet, especially the microbiology of our planet? How do we do that? How do we as scientists reach out to government, to culture, to society, to the public, and say, this is very, very important, and if we don't understand this, we're going to be in trouble? Um, it comes to a favorite quote of mine. This is from Julian Davies. He says, once the, once the diversity of the microbial world is catalogued, it will make astronomy look like a pitiful science. It will make astronomy look silly. Because it, there, are, there are one times 10 to the 22 stars in the known universe. That's a, that's a, a billion, uh, that's a billion billion. That's a, not, not, not very many stars. It's like 10 billion billion. Uh, but there are a billion more bacteria in the oceans alone than there are stars in the known universe. So Ramey said one times 10 to the 30, one followed by 30 zeros. That's just in the oceans. Viruses unfold again more, one times 10 to the 31. If you consider the entire number of cells in the soil, under, this, under the soil, in the rocks, in the air, um, there, are, there are bacteria in the clouds, in the air you're breathing now, um, on the desks and on the chairs, on the carpet, um, in your bodies, every single one of you is 100 trillion bacteria the numbers become inconceivably large. One times 10 to the 33 bacterial cells on this planet. That's, that's a considerably larger number. That's a biological number. There are no, in, 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 uh, in, in England, in, uh, in, in America, we, we, when we think about large numbers, we use the word astronomical. It's an astronomically large number. Well, that's, that's a tiny number. An astronomically large number is not a big number anymore. We want biological numbers. Wow, that, that, that's a really biological number, man. That's huge. That's an important number. And that's the way we will, we will turn the public's imagination. Make this into something which is magnificent. Something which is incredibly small, but incredibly powerful. And then we will capture people's imagination, and I will get more funding. Um, this is a friend of mine, Ronald O'Dor. He ran the International Census of Marine Life, looking at animals and plants and bacteria across the global ocean for 10 years. Um, and he came up with a theory. He, uh, we call it O'Dor's Law. It says, chemistry and physics create laws. These are guided laws. They are laws which cannot be broken. But biology creates lawyers that find loopholes in the laws. This is why bacteria can live anywhere. You say that life and proteins cannot survive at uh, 99 degrees centigrade? I'll find you a bacteria that can live with its proteins intact at 99 degrees centigrade. You know, you tell me a bacteria cannot live without light from the sun? I'll find you a bacteria that can live without light from the sun. You tell me you can't, a bacteria can't live in the, in the deep rock? I'll find you a bacteria that can live in deep rock. Um, and I have a, uh, well... Ramey yesterday challenged me to come up with a, a colliery for this. So this is a follow-up theory. So this is Gilbert's colliery. Um, for a given constant, microbiology will find a non-linear permutation that defies that constant. So for any given 
con constant that a chemist or a physics person or any e ecologist can come up with, I will defy that constant with a bacteria or a, a community of bacteria. And this is me in my younger days. Um, this is, a, this is our uh, impression of marine metagenomics, where you take cells and you extract DNA from those cells, and then we make as predictions or associations about the types of proteins that exist in the cells in, from that DNA. It's predictive biology. We're saying that we believe that the community is capable of doing these particular functions, and that's an important association to make. Um, I say the, the Earth Microbiome Project has been going for two years now. Uh, we, it's, a, it's a systematic characterization of microbial life. We want to basically look at environments across the entire planet, um, and not just environments that are situated in different countries, but ecological gradients, because bacteria are not Russian, bacteria are not um, Somali, bacteria are not Chinese. They are, they are organisms that exist along ecological gradients, gradients of temperature, gradients of pH, gradients of uh, or carbon concentration or, um, or pressure or light availability. That's the, where they live. They live in these gradients. So if we sample along these gradients, we will understand how microbes exist and structure themselves in this world. Um, Another thing, this is from a colleague of mine, Jonathan Eisen, who's um, a professor at University of California, Davis. He came up with this, with this um, analogy that, that we were basically trying to uh, come up with a field guide to microbes. So, you know, you have a field guide to birds, or you can have a field guide to bacteria. Where is this particular bacteria found? Who does it associate with? What's its range? Is it found in one little uh, hot spring in, in Yellowstone National Park? Or is it found across every hot environment on the planet? Is it everywhere? Or is it endemic to a specific area? And, and this is a way of, again, capturing the public imagination. Most people, the only reason they think about bacteria is when they're killing the bacteria on their kitchen surfaces to stop their children from getting sick. And, and that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's the battle. But less than 0.001% of known bacteria are pathogenic to humans. So 99.99% of bacteria are good. And they're actually very beneficial to us. Without them, we would be dead. Therefore, I think we should give them some respect. Um, the Earth Microbiome Project is a global initiative. We have um, samples from all over um, the world. We actually were going to get some samples from uh, the Silver Oasis in, in Egypt, um, but the, uh, the uh, Department of Energy would not let me send my, um, my um, assistant out to do the sampling um, when uh, because it happened on January 28th, and apparently something happened on January 25th, um, which stops us from actually getting the samples. Uh, it now seems that that wouldn't have been a problem. But, um, so there are a lot of people, over 120 um, colleagues, so collaborators from 50 institutes in over 25 countries, and we're constantly looking for new uh, people to come in. Essentially, uh, we work with you, the scientists, in different environments. You bring us your samples. We will, you've categorized these samples, say um, it's, a, it's a soil sample, it has this pH, this amount of total organic carbon, it's uh, found in this location, I collected it at this time. And then you give us that sample, we do DNA extraction, we do 16S, 18S, um, uh, PCR, so we understand the bacterial community and the eukaryotic community. And then we do shotgun metagenomics to understand the function. And then we make that data publicly available immediately. That data is your data, you can publish that data, you can do whatever you want with it. We just reserve the right to use that data to understand global patterns of bacterial distribution and function. So we're looking at protein function and we're looking at bacterial taxonomic distribution. Um, here's, uh, we have over 60,000 samples pledged. These are sampling sites that have so far been sampled. Not many in North Africa, we need to address that. We have quite a few in South Africa. In fact, this, the, the Earth Microbiome Project does include humans much to Ramey's uh, uh, interest yesterday. We, a human is just another animal on this planet, and so we are interested in sampling humans. 
And this, uh, this is a transect of, um, of uh, tribal uh, people living in, across Africa and uh, their fecal material. So we're trying to understand digestive uh, microbial communities um, through different tribes in Africa. Um, and uh, we, here we have samples in Antarctica, samples in the Arctic, and all over. Um, the in, in, important thing is they are, as I said, they're selected based on their position in these environmental gradients. And we have this exceptionally rich contextualization. This is important. You can't just collect bacteria. I couldn't just take a swab, swab this desk and say, oh, there are some bacteria there, and I found it on a desk. You need to, I need to tell you exactly when I collected it, where I was in, with the GPS, with the satellite coordinates, um, what material this desk is made out of, what was the temperature on the desk, the humidity, these, these are very important characteristics. They place the community in those environmental gradients. If I know where that organism or those organisms were found, I can understand how that community is structured over space and time. Um, this is some initial data. This is the tree of life for bacteria. The tree of life, uh, so this is a, uh, an evolutionary tree. It's uh, not showing up very well here, but if you consider this is a phylogenetic tree, and uh, what we see here, every black line is a bacterial lineage, a bacterial species. And there's four, 408,000 species identified in this tree. Um, if we look at some previous studies, Costello et al. 2009, they sampled 100 different environments across the planet. They actually found 14% of the species identified in this tree of life. Um, the, the Human Microbiome Project, $165 million dollar NIH, National Institute of Health Initiative from the US. They found 17% of the bacteria in the tree of life with their existing research. Uh, other human projects, this is MetaHit. Um, there's a European Chinese initiative. We heard about this yesterday um, from Haoming Yang uh, from the BGI. Uh, they found 19% of the species in this tree of life. Uh, other host projects, these are projects that took fecal material from animals um, around the world, including um, lions and tigers and bears and various other organisms. Uh, they found 27% of the species in the tree of life. The Earth Microbiome Project alone, by sequencing the first 10,000 samples, has covered 82% of this tree. All of the other samples cover 48%. So we're nearly twice as big as all of the other studies that have ever gone before, because we've selected samples along the environmental gradients. We're finding new diversity, we're finding new life by doing that kind of survey. Where do we find the most diversity? In oil spill sediments and stream water. Stream water may be counterintuitive. Um, in stream water, there's a lot of soil particles that break off from the banks of the river, and they fall into the, into the river, and so you have Bacteria from the soil, bacteria from the, uh, from the stream, bacteria from the sediment, from the rocks. So it's actually quite a diverse system. Then it's soil, freshwater sediment, well water. Insect, insect uh, guts, they were the uh, insect gastrointestinal tract was the lowest diversity environment. But when we're looking for new diversity, these are places that have the highest number of novel species which we've never seen before. Insects were actually, insect gastrointestinal tract had the most of novel diversity. So it's the least diverse environment. Everything we found was quite new. Um, then oil spill sediments, as well as, being the, the, uh, as well as being the most diverse environment, they're also one of the environments in which we find the most new organisms. And this is from the, the oil spill um, in the Gulf of Mexico, the, uh, um, uh, the disaster from 2010. Um, just to show you that we can, we can do things very quickly, uh, we had a, our big press release at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting uh, this year in February, um, where we had um, about uh, 50 or so press officers from around the world came in, we presented the research, they went away and made their stories. While they were there, we swabbed, we gave them little swabs, so um, cotton buds on, on plastic sticks, with sterile water, and we asked them to swab their phones and their shoes. So the sole of their shoe and their phones. And what we see here is a, is a, um, a beta diversity plot. So uh, every single dot is a sample, and the distance between two dots is how similar the community is between those two samples. And all the red dots are mobile phones, and all the green dots are shoes. 
Now, we, what we did is we took, took that sample data, we rushed it back to the lab, we DNA extracted, we 16S PCR'd to understand the bacterial community structure, and we sequenced in under four days, and then put everything on the web. In fact, in the whole process took uh, just under four and a half days to get this data public and put it in the public imagination. So very, very quickly now, I can give you a rapid turnaround. It would actually have been quicker, but the, the FedEx, the uh, postal service, was late with the sample. Um, this little blue triangle was an Australian journalist who didn't have a mobile phone. So there are people out there without mobile phones. That's shocking to me. Most shocking thing about this survey. And shoes were very diverse. All the high peaks here are high diversity peaks are shoes. Phones were very undiverse. Um, we're doing the Earth Microbiome Project is now associated with something called genomic observatories. This is a network of sites working to generate genomic observations over long timescales. So we want to go into environments and look at how the system changes over very long timescales, both at the microbiological level and at the level of animals and plants. Only by doing time series analysis can we understand the variability in an ecosystem. That provides us with a fundamental understanding of how that system changes as environments change. Um, this is my favorite system, the English Channel. It separates the French from the English, which is a good thing. Um, what we've been able to do in this environment is, um, and that should be, that should be working, why is that not working? Oh, well, never mind. What we've been able to do in this environment is model the entire ecosystem by looking at several locations and sequencing the bacteria. So what we see here is the similarity across um, the entire English Channel for the types of bacteria that are found there. So we can now predict and even forecast what types of bacteria will be in what locations in the English Channel up to 20 to 30 years in advance. We don't know if we're right, but like every climate or weather prediction, I'm the weatherman for bacteria. And I'm basically trying to say, next week we're going to have hail of uh, bacteriodetes and firmicutes coming up uh, from uh, the south. Um, I may be accurate, I may not be accurate, but the point is we can now predict. And 90% of the time we're accurate. So we're actually better than the weatherman. And the, these kind of uh, maps are helping us to understand where we should next be sampling. We're also doing, and this is another animation that's not working for some reason on your Mac. We're also doing is taking uh, functional information about, about the environment and predicting how that information can be used to tell us what kinds of metabolites will be turned over. For example, here we're looking at carbon dioxide. And this is actually, if this was working, a, um, a, um, a, a three-dimensional um, information about the, the turnover of carbon dioxide. I can now predict uh, for certain environments how much carbon dioxide will be emitted from the location uh, by looking at the bacterial community function. So this is a 24-hour cycle, and right now the CO2 is dark, where the uh, metabolites around it are very light. The CO2 is dark because it's being consumed. When it goes yellow, it means it's being generated, and I, I can track that. And we're actually able to predict the change, uh, this, this predicted turnover based on genomic information about the bacteria in the sea, uh, this correlates 85% with measured fluxes of CO2 coming out the surface. So we're actually able to get amazingly accurate predictions about the ability of this community to turn over environmental parameters. Um, just to finish up, I have something called the home microbiome study. I don't know how I'm doing for time, but I'm, I'm okay. The, um, we, so, you know, as I said, if I'm interested in an environment, I'll put microbiome study at the end, and then I have a project. The home microbiome study is a new way of trying to understand how we interact with bacteria in indoor spaces. One of the places we spend a lot of our time, most of it sleeping, is in our houses. And in our houses, um, we, our children spend a lot of our time, their time, um, and, uh, and our families spend a lot of their time there. So it's important to understand what role the bacteria play in, in the health of our homes and the health of our, our families and children. Um, 
One of the things we're interested in is what happens when you move into a new house. So you moved from your old house into a new house. The, old, the new house you moved into, unless you're very lucky and you got a brand new house, somebody else was living there. And that person was shedding skin cells. They were touching the surfaces of their home with their hands. They were walking on the floors with bare feet. They were exchanging their bacterial community with the surfaces of their home and the air of their home. Now, you can clean that house as much as you want. It will still have their bacteria. But what happens when your bacterial community meets the bacterial community of your new home? Do you start resembling that bacterial community? Does it rub off on you? Do you start resembling the bacterial community of your house? Or does the house start to look like your bacterial community? Or do you stay mutually exclusive? Do you retain your community and the house retains its? Or do you reach a new state, a new level, where both of you are significantly different to what you were before? Um, this, is some, uh, this is some work. It's a time series analysis of a young couple, um, uh, a, uh, a married uh, a man and a woman um, who just moved to America. Um, and they moved into an apartment flat in, in Chicago. And what we were doing is we were looking at the bacterial community, and there's some species, well, some bacterial classes, bacterial community on their hands, in their nose, so up their nasal cavity, and on their foot uh, for both people, and then looking at the bedroom floor, the kitchen floor, kitchen counter, kitchen light switch, bathroom doorknob, and front doorknob. And there's a couple of interesting points here. The, both people, the man and the woman, both of their feet were heavily um, uh, populated with Staphylococcaceae. Staph Staphylococcus, Staph. Not a pathogenic form of Staph. I said 90% of Staphylococcus is not pathogenic, it's actually perfectly healthy. And every single one of you will have Staphylococcus on your skin. In fact, probably now on the desks and the computers as well. So their feet were heavily abundant for Staphylococcus. Their bedroom floor, however, when it started, was heavily abundant for mycoplasma. So there was a lot of mycoplasma on the floor, mycoplasma ACA. Now, at day six, however, the floor of their bedroom started to resemble the bacterial community on their feet. So their feet, the bacteria living on the soles of their feet were being exchanged with the floor, but it took six days for that to happen. Now, maybe they didn't wear bare feet for six days or something strange happened, but we can at least say that there is an exchange of bacteria between you and your house. And in this instance, the house as a whole started to look more like the people who moved in there after six days. So you can say after six days, I've got rid of the old tenants and now this is my house. Well, my, well, our house. Me and my m microbes. Um, kitchen counters were an interesting one. Kitchen, the, the bacterial community in kitchen counters was very, very similar no matter what house we looked at. No matter what cleaning products people used, and, and no matter how often they cleaned them. So the bacterial community on the kitchen counter never seemed to change, no matter what house we were looking at. And it was always populated. But over time, there was fluctuation. In fact, here, the community, this red line here on the kitchen counter uh, indicates a point when they used um, Clorox bleach to clean the surface of the home, 10% Clorox bleach. It was, um, the, the, they were Spanish, so maybe they decided it. But the, the, the environment changed significantly between before and after. So, you know, you can shift the community, but on the whole, they all look very similar. Um, here's my acknowledgements, cast of thousands, um, all my collaborators and uh, the people in my lab now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, uh, very interesting talk, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. We, we'll have a couple of questions now, and then we'll have, at the end, another time for questions to all speakers. So uh, please, uh, is there a microphone? I think you can turn the mic, can they turn the mic on to ask a question? Yeah, they can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Um, certainly a very enjoyable talk, especially for a plant biologist like myself. Um, our lab, our lab has a history of 62 years of looking at microbes in plant systems. Uh, in these 62 years, we've characterized approximately 430 
uh, my microbe related species. Uh, the problem we found increasingly is that no microbe is an island. Uh, and we find that a number of the functions, a number of the functions, <laughs> Increasingly trying to look at interactive uh, effects, especially this interesting mutualistic relationship that seems to be developed uh, as a consequence of evolution between higher plants and microbes. Yes. Uh, I would be interested to know your thoughts on this approach uh, as well as um, some suggestions as to where we should go. Uh, the problem is that we don't have much support for this research. Uh, because in the eyes of the universities that many of my students and myself are based at, uh, it's not really important in face of sure, some sure. of the other big projects. Where, where you should go. Okay, so um, I, 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 uh, I started up something recently. Um, this is the wonder of America, right? They have more money than cents. I'm English. Um, I went there and they have a lot of money in America. A lot of money for science. Not, not enough. We need more. But, um, but a lot of money. Um, and I started up something. I was interested in plant microbe interactions in the rhizosphere um, and how the bacterial interactions, as you say, between the bacteria and between the bacterial community in the plant actually influence plant productivity. So could I make better, uh, could I increase biomass production? Could I, could I change the, um, the, maybe the flavor of fruits by looking at uh, the bacterial community and how it changes? Um, so I think that's the key thing. Yeah, you're right. Study in situ. The other thing is um, I went to my favorite plant system. I, I went to the Merlot grapevines because um, I like wine. So I, I made it the Merlot microbiome project. So again, stick microbiome projects on the end of anything you're interested in. So the Merlot microbiome project is trying to understand how bacterial communities in the, in the bulk soil, in the rhizosphere, in the roots, so actually inside the roots, on the leaves and on the grapes actually affects the productivity of the plant, the health of the plant, i.e. how it resists pathogens, and also the quality and the taste of the wine. Therefore, I have to do a lot of wine tasting. This is a, obviously a travesty, and, uh, and I hate myself for it, but it's something I have to do. Um, but that, that, uh, I think that's the key. You have to go into environments and you have to choose systems which are very stable, which can be explored with temporal components. And if you have good systems and you're worried about not having enough funding to do it, email me and we can talk about bringing those systems into the Earth Microbiome Project. Because um, if it's a good enough system and you think it represents a novel niche, then it may be relevant for us. Thank you. One, one more question, quick question, and then we will we'll, we'll keep the other questions for later. numbers, right, but nothing about air biome. Oh, yeah, and uh, something else, when you studied the kitchen, the home biomes, uh, you provided on the tables, kitchen tables, but nothing about the air itself, or you did this, uh, so I missed uh -huh. it. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, actually, and, uh, that's not indoor air. That's, that's indoor. actually out this that's indoor. outdoor, that's I, outdoor. I, this is outdoor? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, this we, is outdoor. Yeah, we and do have uh, indoor air, um, uh, but the results are in the In home, when you provided in the kitchen stove, you didn't uh, provide the air in yeah. the home itself. And even in the meetings, also, when you provided the figure about uh, microbes on the phones and in the shoes, sure. you sh you, I think uh, in the air also it could be very interesting to know that if the researcher brought their microbes with them or just got it from the atmosphere. Yes, and yes. And I wonder, the microbes in the phones are uh, human from human microbes? From human hands. 
the, the hands. The hands. So the, the bacteria on the phones look very much like the hands. And the site of the shoes samples from the inside the shoes? Yeah, so, so there's, there's two interesting points. It's actually from the sole, from the sole from of the, the sole. shoe. Yeah. Okay. So okay. there's two interesting points there. One, um, a very good proxy for the air microbiome is dust. Because the bacteria in the air are mostly attached to particles. And when the particles settle out, you can get a very good understanding of the components of the air microbiome from the dust and surfaces. So we've been using a very unique technique with a tiny, tiny little hoover, uh, like a vacuum, a very tiny little vacuum that sucks up the dust along corners and edges onto a filter and then extracting DNA from that filter. We actually also have a technique for t looking at the metal concentration of the particles. The other thing is, if we can use this information, this is my last point, if we can use this information to track where somebody has been walking by looking at the microbiome on their shoe and then the environments they've been in, uh, we may have a very good CSI, uh, crime scene investigation or FBI approach, yeah? Um, that, that would be very valid, but we need to build up enough data. So I need to have more money to look in more environments and more shoes so I can be J. Edgar Hoover looking at fingerprints. Both. I'll come and talk to you afterwards. <laughs> well, th thank you so much. And uh, I know we, we all have more questions, but we need to hear from all speakers. So uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Hamza Durri, who is the chair of the Department of Biology at the American University in Cairo. Uh, Dr. Durri has toured the world during his studies. So he started in Alexandria, as many things started. He got here, and like many good biologists, he started as a chemist. Uh, and then he got a PhD in biochemistry from Brazil, or from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and then moved to New York, New Jersey for his postdoc in the Albert Einstein Institute and then in the Roche Institute, then back to Brazil. Then lucky for us, he came back to Egypt to, to work in the American University in Cairo. He, he is uh, organizing the Red Sea Metagenome Project uh, in collaboration with KAUST in Saudi Arabia. And he has had many awards, over 50 papers, and many other merits. But for the sake of time, I will, uh, without further ado, I will welcome Dr. Hamza Eddori. And as with every speaker, I know one inside information about Dr. Eddori is he's a very good expert at chocolate tasting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So do we get to hear about the chocolate microbiome project? <laughs> I would be uh, a volunteer. <laughs> you do wine. I'll do, I'll do wine. You do chocolate. Together we'll uh, make a good partnership. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Rami Aziz for the invitation and uh, the organizer too for inviting me. Uh, to this meeting by vision and uh, today I will try to present for you what we are doing at the biology department in AUC. Uh, when we start research at the biology department in AUC, the decision was to go to uh, a specific uh, area of research which is unique uh, for the region, yet it is important for the scientific community worldwide. And uh, I'm not going to make it, uh, I'm going to make a thing short now. There's a couple of environment, a couple of, uh, uh, okay, thank you, places in this, regi in this region, especially in Egypt, uh, that is very specific and very important. But the uh, uh, Red, uh, Red Sea is one of them, and the Nile, and I just will come in the end uh, to the Nile. But let's start with the Red Sea. So the Red Sea is, is very specific, uh, is, is, is uh, is a regional um, in the area. And we start a uh, collaboration with, uh, 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 with KAUST, uh, King Abdullah University for Science and Technology, and on the left, you could see um, 
So here is cost, and here is AUC, and here is red, uh, the red C, so it's specific to the area. And uh, when I was sitting in the uh, uh, opening uh, of the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, the king says that he wants to have this institution as a house of wisdom. Uh, I hope, and I am really very much hoping, that it will be the house of wisdom. We need a lot of wisdom in this region. Um, so we start this project about metagenomics uh, of uh, the Red Sea. Then why is the Red Sea other than it's a regional um, environment. So before I start, those are the uh, scientists and the researcher from different institutions, from, uh, from AUC, from the Marine Biology Laboratory at Woods Hole, Mitchell Sogan, from Virginia Tech, from KAUST, and from uh, uh, the Sea uh, Science Center in KAUST too. So the topic I will be addressed today is the following. Background information, and I would like to summarize what is unique uh, to the Red Sea. Uh, then after that, I will go and outline uh, the objective of the KAUST AUC project. Then I will go to the potential, some results, just to, to give you some result what we have. Uh, potential biological sensor uh, to measure environmental change in the oceans. Out the work we are doing now, and potential biotechnological enzyme from Atlantis to Brian Pool, and I will come later to what is Atlantis to Brian Pool. So the background, so uh, the Red Sea formed within uh, the zone of geological depression and faulting, which we call it the Rift Valley. It's desert enclosed, has no permanent uh, inflow from river to the coastal sea. Rainfall in the region is very low has a surface area of about 45,000 kilometers and maximum depths of 2,500 meters. Uh, it's relatively young, okay? And there's part of the Red Sea, different part of the Red Sea, where the temperature goes all the way up to 70 degree. Uh, it's the salinity there is uh, almost saturated salt. It's very high concentration of metal and anoxic environment. And that's what's Atlantis too, which I will come to it soon. Okay, so the outline and objective of our project is to establish a public Red Sea metagenomic database, and most probably it will end up in the Earth's uh, microbiome soon. Okay, comprehensive description of the Red Sea microbiome community through metagenomic approach, uh, describing the metabolic pathway and physiological process of the Red Sea microbial communities, uh, novel biotechnological products such as enzyme, bioactive compound, and uh, antimicrobial agent, and establishing, this is one of the most important for me, is establish a world-recognized marine genomic research in the region. Uh, so this work uh, was done, as I said, with King Abdullah University of Science and Technology together with Woods Hall. Uh, Woods Hall is uh, uh, NASA of the sea, uh, and we participate in this expedition. So we had three expeditions until now, one in uh, Oceanus Expedition, which is a vessel of the Woods Hall, then another two expeditions. In this expedition, we collected samples from the Red Sea, and I just will concentrate on two, on two uh, locations now, two environments. Uh, the first environment is uh, uh, the Atlantis II deep. So what's the Atlantis II deep? It's a brine pool, okay? What does it mean brine pool? It's a pool 2,200 meters below the sea surface, around six kilometers, okay? And it's full of saturated salt. The temperature there is 70 degrees because it seems like there's active hydrothermal vent. Uh, it's very high concentration of heavy metal. In fact, a lot of industry is trying now, well tried. Thanks God, until now they did not start, but they have a couple of projects to extract uh, heavy metal from that, and it's completely anoxic, and certainly there is no light. So we took samples from uh, this, uh, this environment with Woods Hole, and the other one is the Kibrit uh, brine pool. Kibrit means sulfur in Arabic. So it is uh, 1,400 meters below the sea surface. It's high salinity. Uh, it's high in H2S and the temperature is not high. But the most now which I'm going to talk about it today is the uh, Atlantis II uh, brine pool. I will talk about it later. 
Okay, so we took samples from Cullum, from a Cullum. Okay, here is the Brian Pool of Atlantis II, and take samples from different depths, from 50 meter to 100, 700, and 1500. We took that also from another uh, 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 Brian Pool and also from Kibrit. Okay, I will concentrate on this column now. So uh, the samples, the water sample was passed through three mic micrometer, 0.8 micrometer, and 0.1 micrometer filter, and the microbial uh, community trap on the 0.1 micrometer uh, filter, we uh, uh, analyze it for metagenomics. <coughs> so I, I just want to go fast on that. We have a high thorogenome sequencing facility in, in AUC, we have 454. We have 96 capillary ABI, and we have high performance computational system. So we have a well-established genomic facility and computational system also in AUC. Okay, so let's go to the first uh, uh, point. This two point I would like to talk to you about it. The first one, how we used our information which we uh, generated for uh, metagenomics from the rich sea, from the column above Atlantis II, to understand potential biological sensor uh, to measure environmental change in ocean. What does it mean that I will come to this soon? So I will summarize on this slide, to the best of my knowledge, all the metagenomic data data that is available publicly on the okay, and they have certain line of uh, 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 um, for, for instance, um, the, the data is more than certain certain amount. There is there is many data, but this data they produce very low reads, which is not enough for uh, the analysis that we would like to do. So here is depth, okay, and here is the data. So the first one in North Pacific uh, Gray, which is Aloha Station, and they did uh, metagenomic analysis from different depths from uh, 25 all the way to uh, 4,000 meter. So, and those number is the number of freeze uh, time 10 to the power of three. That means it's 0 0.6 million, 0 0.6 million, 0 0.4, and so. Uh, this is through uh, different uh, techniques of sequencing. The second column, which was done until now, is the Sargasso Sea, and as you can see it's here, okay? And it has uh, different uh, reads also and different, at uh, different depths. Those are the only two columns available in the literature until now. There's another one, I will come to it now. Okay, so we decided that we have to, to introduce a third column. Okay, and that's what we did. We collected samples from different depths. Okay, and we have now uh, uh, depth related uh, uh, metagenomic data set for the Red Sea. So we produce around uh, 1.1 million reads by 454 and 50 meter and all the way to 1500 above the Atlantis II brine pools. So those now, this, this work is not published yet, okay? But uh, we are almost there. Uh, and those are the only three columns available that you could take them as a reference column today or for depth related uh, analysis. Uh, and this is, I want to stress on that, okay? They are the only three columns available. One of them is not published our work yet, okay? For depth related uh, environment. Then you will have another column, which you call it the Ikiki column, which is uh, 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 near Chile, near Peru and Chile. Okay, this column, uh, was done, but it's enviro the environment there is completely different, and I will come to that later. <laughs> okay, then the Mediterranean, there's uh, some data set uh, from the Mediterranean, and uh, there is another one from uh, the Marmara Sea. Okay, and there is the last one, which unfortunately I discovered, that I didn't put it in the slide, from the Puerto Rico Trench which is somewhere around here, 6,000 meters below the sea surface. So we took all this data and also we analyzed also uh, one, two, three, four, five data sets from uh, uh, the work of Craig Venter, uh, uh, which was published in a couple of, uh, he has a couple of publications on that. 
So the idea is to uh, uh, develop depth related, uh, so we have a depth related environment for 11 sites around uh, the world ocean, including four new data obtained from the Atlantis II, and we start analyzing all those data and we want to compare them. So three different columns. So, we just, so here are the, our, uh, the, the numbers of the bases analyzed. Uh, is around, around six billion uh, base pair, which we analyzed. Okay, and we start by analyzing first uh, uh, the data sets from the three reference columns, which I will call them the three reference columns, which is Atlantis II, Aloha, uh, uh, and BATS. Okay, so uh, we did similarity analysis using uh, EGNOG uh, version 2, retrieve normalized abundant uh, of the identified cluster or COGS, then we did common uh, significant difference uh, in the abundance between the three columns and the, uh, uh, the hierarch hierarchical clustering. You show, you, it, it's shown here, and here are the different, uh, the different uh, data set or the different sites. Okay, so this Atlantis II, for instance, 220 meters. Uh, this bats 20 meters, this Atlantis 250, this bats, and all the different depths from the three different uh, 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 reference, what we call it, reference, uh, reference column. And as you could see right away, that all those uh, data sets, uh, each, si each line of those is a cog. Okay, I don't have time really to go through what's cog, but uh, uh, so as you see, the data set split. Each one of those cog refer to uh, metabolic. Uh, uh, a pathway, metabolic or physiological uh, uh, activities, okay? So each one of those is line is one cog, and we see that our cogs here, uh, the data set separated very clearly between two, uh, um, uh, between two, uh, two part, okay? So the, the ATC1 Aloha and DAS profile is a division of the data set into two depths related group. As you see, they are separated into two depths related group. The surface near surface zone and the deeper zone. So you could see here all this data, okay, is uh, surface or near surface, and this data all the deep. So the first thing when you analyze all this thing together, you could see com very clearly that. This observation, it was observed by many uh, workers, workers researchers before, but usually comparing the two data sets. Okay, here we are comparing all of them together. And it seems like this distribution is, uh, is light-related, uh, is light-related biological activity of the microbial community in, uh, uh, in this environment. To go to the next one. There are six minutes. Then I have to go back to the Then we said that if the three data sets that we produce for the three column is correct, then if we join all the data set except the Ikiki that we have, we will we should, we must have the same division. And that's what's happened really. So we included here the single depth the surface water uh, and each single depth is, and as we see again, it separates very nicely into two uh, depth-related uh, depth uh, uh, groups, okay? And this depth-related gr group I will show you now is related to, uh, uh, to, uh, to light, which is uh, photic and non-photic uh, 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 groups. So we took all this data now and we said, okay, let's produce a reference photic, a photic global core depth related cogs because they are separated. And if you analyze all uh, uh, the groups that we have, there's the cogs, you're gonna find it very clearly that's really related to photic and non-photic uh, uh, depth related cogs. So we produce now a reference, what we call it reference photic, a photic global core depth related 
uh, cog. And if you see here, each one of those columns, which they are the reference columns, okay? You could see here that the 50 meter, okay, the relative, uh, the photic to the aphotic cogs abundance, okay, you could see this is, a, this is a, uh, uh, the photic. Here is the line which is determined between photic and non photic, and here all, all the 200, 700, and 1500. The same thing if you go to the aloha, you have the same thing with those are the photic, and this one is the photic, and if you go to the bath, it's the same thing. So, and this is the average between them. So those are, uh, we call them reference photic, aphotic global core uh, depth related cogs, and we use those uh, 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 reference to analyze uh, another environment. What's the other environment that we would like to uh, analyze? The other environment is the environment at Ikiki. As I told you, the environment at Ikiki here, okay, is a bit different. And why is it different? I am not a, a marine biologist. I would love to be a marine biologist, but I don't think there's time for that, maybe in the next generation. Okay, so uh, that was the marine biologist tell us about uh, the Ikiki site. Uh, the Akiki site has what's called the Humboldt, cur the, the Humboldt uh, current system. What's the Humboldt current system? The Humboldt current system flow along the west coast of South America, as you see here. I have three minutes. Okay, so I don't know what to do. Okay. <laughs> so it's flow uh, 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 around the... Uh, so the Humboldt are along the west coast of the South America and drive a major upwelling uh, system that bring cold nutrient water toward the surface of the water. Uh, okay, this promote growth of, of a dense uh, uh, microbial community there. Uh, this, this place there, they call it the most productive marine ecosystem in the global. What's happened there? When there is a huge growth of microbial community, the concentration of oxygen drop dramatically. In fact, it's go all the way to uh, uh, extreme hypoxic condition, and uh, uh, the light doesn't penetrate that much. It penetrates all the way to 30 meters, that's all. So here is the, the light, okay, as you see it. So this part is uh, when the light reach 1% of the surface water, and here is the, uh, uh, where is the, uh, in each column where the, uh, uh, we, we see 1% of uh, the light on uh, the surface. So here is uh, uh, photic and this one is non-photic. Okay, and you see the Ikiki sites, which I describe it now, it's joined in the clustering, uh, the uh, aphotic region, and despite that, you took sample from 50 meter, and this is, I mean, it's okay because it's, it's a photic uh, environment. Okay, if you go on the Ikiki site and you look at it, you're gonna find that the Ikiki site in our reference column, okay, the 50 meter, although it is clustered with the uh, 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 aphotic, okay, it still has a lot of uh, photic cards. So this is one thing that we could analyze the environment using this way. Now, if you take uh, 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 oxygen, for instance, and here I, 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 I put all this, this side depending on the oxygen concentration going from 200 micromolar all the way to 3.24 and 11 micromolar per, uh, per kilogram, okay? And you look there and you choose one of the photic uh, cogs, which is nitrate reductase, you will find a very interesting thing that nitrate reductase starts the abundance of nitrate reductase start extremely increased huh, when the oxygen concentration reach below 20 micromoles per kilogram. So the nitrate reductase, it seems like it could be uh, taken as a sensor for that, and there is a reason for that, which I'm not going to go through it now. Okay. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, for the aphotic, which is uh, the uh, photolyase. And as you see here, if you put all this, it depends on the light. Okay, so you could see all this part here is a photic. Okay, all the site is photic, and this is a photolyase. Okay, you go to two sites, uh, which is uh, uh, again a kiki, uh, and you can see that they contain high uh, amount of 
photo layer is, despite the fact that they are in a, a photic uh, region. Okay, and this is uh, due to the microbe are circulating there, and it has biologically active uh, photosynthetic. Uh, thing. The other one is, is, is the Marmara Sea. When we did the Marmara Sea, okay, we saw that the Marmara Sea has very high photic, uh, I mean very high uh, uh, amount of uh, photolyase. Why it has very high uh, photolyase? Photolyase is an enzyme required uh, uh, um, uh, when you have ultraviolet to, uh, for, for DNA damage, for correction of DNA damage. So why 1,000 meter below you have still photolyase there? Doing what? Okay, so then when we went to the Marmara Sea and we look at the environmental condition in the Marmara Sea, so the Marmara Sea falls between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean Sea, uh, is the, the, the salinity of Mediterranean Sea is much higher than the salinity of the Marmara Sea. And the, Marmara and the, Medi the Mediterranean joins the Marmara Sea with a, a strait here, with a Dardari Strait, and it's just 35 meters or 40 meters. So the only water was coming from the Mediterranean Sea will be uh, uh, a surface water, which is what we call it photic. And for this season, because it has a high density, it will fall and stay in the bottom. Staying in the bottom and you collect water from 1,000 meters, then you could explain pretty well why you have photo layers. Now, in one minute, I will go to uh, uh, application. As I told you that the uh, Atlantis II has 72 degree, it has very high concentration of salt, saturated salt, and we look for some enzyme with biotechnological application there. One of them is the heavy metal uh, detoxifying enzyme. One of them is mercury reductase. Uh, we uh, got this, uh, uh, the sequence of the, uh, uh, this enzyme from our data set, and we synthesize the gene. We express the genes in Escherichia coli, and as you see here, uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration, so this is transformant, okay, with the mercury reductase, and, and this one is non-transformant, and as you could see here, uh, um, uh, there's a uh, halo around here, which show that the, um, the cell uh, start dying, at concentration of 80 micromole, while here the cell, the clearing zone, is starting from 10. Unfortunately, the slide is, is not okay. So it shows you very clear that cell here could support uh, until 80 micromolar and mercury, which is very high. Okay, the other one, so we, cons we, we purify the enzymes, okay, and we, we analyze the, cons the uh, effect of sodium chloride on the activity, and as you see, up to four molar, Okay, you still have a, a very high activity. Okay, the other part is the temperature, and as you see here, all the way to 70 degree, you still uh, the enzyme is active. Okay, if you look at the uh, three-dimensional structure of this enzyme and you compare it with, uh, from non-extremophilic uh, uh, organism, you're going to see that there is a very critical substitutions in the in the structure. Of the, of the enzyme. Here is valine, valine, alanine, alanine, glycine is substituted with aspartic, aspartic, glutamic, glutamic, aspartic, which they are enzyme which usually give very high stability uh, in very high concentration of, uh, uh, of salts. Uh, those are some uh, of our strength and I wish I have uh, all the picture and Mariam is one of them sitting here with us. She is my consultant in uh, bioinformatics. Uh, and thank you so much for your patience. Um, so we, we, have about, we have less than half hour for the next two talks. So I, I really would restrict the questions to one quick question and then hopefully, I mean, or if, if we want to extend the question sessions later, we can do it during the tea break. So one quick question. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, Dr. Hamza, for your speech. Um, I'll make it brief as possible. Uh, my question is, what's the application of bacteria as uh, a markers um, in, in Red Sea, in Nile, uh, as a marker for pollution? 
Thank you. Yeah, we, we, could, we, could, we could do that. I mean, for instance, uh, for instance, as mentioned uh, before, okay, the oil spill. I mean, there is uh, in, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, bacterial, okay, specific for hydrolysis of of hydrocarbon, which I think gamma. Uh, protobacteria, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and there is genes required for the, uh, the detoxification or the uh, whatever you call it, uh, hydrolysis of, of heavy carbon, the, the genome, the content of the genome in this microbial community increase. Uh, and the same thing we observe it also in, in, our, in our work. For instance, uh, the, gene, the gene for uh, uh, this detoxification enzyme, which I call, you're going to find it increased in many areas which there is very heavy metal, like the brine pool. If you go, for instance, on the column, you'll find that the abundance of this gene is, is, is low. Thank you, Dr. Dori. Please, uh, please join me to welcome uh, our third speaker, Dr. Bas Dutil. Uh, Dr. Dutil is an associate faculty member at Radbu. How do you pronounce it? at Baud University in, in Netherlands. Um, he's a computational biologist. He got his first degree in biology and then moved to a PhD in bioinformatics from Netherlands. And then we met in San Diego while I was, we were both in the same lab uh, at Dr. Rob Edwards' lab in San Diego State University where Dr. Bas Dutel got a grant to, to do some work there. And then he's back now to the Netherlands. One inside information about Dr. Dutil that you might be interested in is that he has a food blog, so everything that he has eaten in the past few years outside, he has a picture for it and some evaluation. It's probably a secret blog. Uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Dutil, and he will talk to us about challenges to analyze and model microbial communities. Thank you very much, Rami, um, and the rest of the organization as well for this invitation. I'm very honored to speak here. Um, so yes, I thought, um, I'd, well, I'll try to keep it as short as I can. So some challenges uh, to analyze a model uh, microbial communities. I'm, I'm working in a lot of different uh, types of projects and Rami asked me to try and focus a little bit on the human uh, related ones. So um, uh, yeah, as a bioinformatician, you get to do a lot of fun stuff. And uh, this is this is some of, some of what uh, I've been doing, at, but also some of the challenges and ideas that um, we might need to face in uh, analyzing um, microbial uh, or analyzing metagenomic data and understanding what, in fact, um, these microorganisms are doing. So, um, as everybody, I hope, realizes, but at least this slide will emphasize it, is that the, micro uh, the microbiome of the uh, human body uh, is very diverse and uh, plays a, a lot of roles, um, as uh, emphasized in the beginning. Um, uh, they can. They are. They are known for. Uh, bacteria are known for their uh, uh, role in disease. So bacteria make you sick, but um, uh, as Jack Gilbert also uh, showed us, that they, there are also a lot of good bacteria. And in fact, within our body, there are many bacteria that um, contribute to our health, that give us uh, uh, substances that we cannot synthesize ourselves. The ones in our gut can make those for us. So there's also. Um, uh, uh, an important role for, for the human microbiota in, in health. Um, because of this uh, importance, there's uh, several large-scale projects that have been uh, uh, focusing on the um, microbiota in, uh, in humans, and uh, the two major ones uh, from Europe and from the United States, the MetaHIT and the uh, Human Microbiome Project, have both um, well, been sequencing uh, uh, complete metagenomes, uh, but also, um, that, that's not on this slide, but also, uh, well, the complete metagenomes are on this slide, but the uh, taxonomic uh, analysis using 16S sequencing from different body sites are, are much, uh, have much more, uh, larger samples as well. Um, so, um, yes, especially the uh, MetaHIT project. I, I, I've just been to uh, a conference where uh, a lot of the results from this MetaHIT project were presented, so I know a little bit more. There, there's uh, a gene catalog of um, genes that, uh, that they have found in the uh, uh, human intestinal tract in, in all these 700 um, 
and 60 uh, metagenomes that they've sampled. And um, so they've, they've made this huge gene catalog that can be used as a reference for um, uh, analysis of metagenome projects uh, based on, uh, uh, for, the, for the human gut. Um, and they've also uh, come up with uh, uh, a wonderful way to analyze uh, metagenomes across samples so, uh, and to, uh, to be able to reconstruct uh, near complete or uh, almost complete um, genomes from those. Um, and that will be published hopefully soon, so then that will, that will give us a, uh, another large set of reference genomes to um, work with for the uh, intestinal system. So what are the kind of questions that we're actually trying to address when looking at um, m metagenomic data? So there's uh, three classes of questions that I've sort of tried to color differently here. The first are the, the simple kind of questions, the, the, the questions that everybody will address right away once you get a metagenome. Those are the first questions that you will answer. Which species are there? And indeed also how many of them are there? As Rami said in the beginning, I didn't put that here. And what can they do? What are the functions that they encode? Then the next kind of questions is, uh, the next kind of questions might be slightly more difficult and those are the ones that, that um, the challenges that I on my title slide are sort of trying to address. So I don't know all the answers here. That's where we're going in the future and that's where I hope everybody is interested in and, and wants to start working on or is working on. Um, the question is like how do these uh, microbes interact with each other and um, how do they interact with the human host? So what in fact makes them important for health or disease uh, of the human organism? And then finally there's a sort of a medical question here at the bottom that um, well, in the end, is very important for human, uh, for human health. I'm not going to go too much into these questions, but they are important. So can we um, help the beneficial organisms in your microbiota, and can we uh, delete or kill the, the ones that make you sick? Um, so the first kind of questions, who is there, basically um, can be addressed with the uh, 16S sequencing projects that I was uh, referring to before. This is, uh, these are taxonomic marker genes. This, this kind of analysis has also been called metataxonomics um, because basically all you can do with that kind of data is find out what taxa are in fact in a certain um, environment. Uh, these, uh, the, char the characteristic is that you cannot get any function from this only by extrapolation of functions so you know that certain taxa uh, always uh, play a certain uh, or fulfill a certain function in a um, in a, in a system, then you can say, okay, probably if I find this taxon, um, these functions will also be there. The good thing about especially 16S sequencing uh, uh, is, is that there's a lot of reference sequences available. There's, there's like uh, more than 3 million reference sequences in the database. And um, uh, one, one paper that I wanted to point out that's really done some really cool work uh, recently is this one. They have looked at all these 16S um, data sets across many, many different environments, so not just the human environments. And they've tried to uh, figure out which taxa, which organisms always occur together in different environments. So basically organisms that like to be together with each other or organisms that like to, that like living in the same environment. So and that's one of the questions that they in fact address. So you see all these clusters, for example, here is a cluster of, uh, um, organisms that always occur together in, uh, in bioreactors. Here's ones that occur in, in uh, open surface waters. Um, and so, so one of the questions that they address is do, do um, organisms like living together because they uh, interact with each other in a positive way or do they uh, like living in the same environment and are they mostly competing for, uh, uh, for the same kind of um, food or things? And so that's actually what seems to be the majority of cases. It seems to be bacteria that live in the same place because they like the same kind of food. Anyway, you should read this paper. It's a really great paper. Um, so the kind of analysis that you can do with this uh, metataxonomics is, uh, for example, look at uh, a case here. This is a pretty horrible picture, but it's just the cleanest one that I could find on Google. It's about uh, colorectal cancer. This is a, uh, some work that uh, I've actually been working on myself. And so what um, 
uh, we and, and two other papers uh, last year analyzed was which organisms do we in fact find on the tumor in colorectal cancer and which organisms do we find on the non-tumor, on the non-affected sites in the same gut of the same person. Um, and so you, here you see that there's certain organisms that we always find on the tumor, off the tumor, so these numbers indicate the different studies that were done. And um, so on the tumor, uh, most, all, all studies found that Fusobacterium is always present on the site of the tumor and um, certain other bacteria were, were found off the tumors. And so if you look at the functions of these organisms, but of course we don't know the functions because we only do the metataxonomic analysis, but if you look at the functions that's generally encoded by those organisms, what we um, extrapolated basically is that the ones that are off the tumor are known to be more detrimental, are actually mo known to be the ones that make you more sick, while the ones that are on the tumor are not necessarily bad bacteria always. So there are some exceptions here, but in general that gave us the idea that there might be drivers for, um, for these colorectal tumors on the sites that have not yet been affected. And then as soon as the tumor starts developing, the, um, the, the environment changes and attracts other bacteria that might, um, yeah, that might not actually be the cause of the tumor in the first place. So it's not even known if bacteria can actually, uh, well, to what extent bacteria actually cause these kind of uh, colorectal tumors, but this is one of the things that you might kind of try to extrapolate from metataxonomic kind of analyses. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so one of, the, uh, one of the things that I also wanted to point out briefly is the, uh, uh, that uh, causation by bacteria or viruses for that matter. Um, so uh, basically I wanted to highlight that the Koch's postulates are very difficult. Um, everybody knows the Koch's postulates. There's three, three steps. You have to find a certain bacterium always associated with a certain disease. And the next thing what you need to do is you need to isolate um, that bacterium to purity and then infect uh, a healthy organism with the bacterium and see if the disease comes back and then you need to re-extract that bacterium from the diseased case once again. And the problem is that this isolation to purity step in uh, metagenomic analysis or in, in uh, using metagenomic data might not be possible because, um, because of the difficulty of um, isolating many, uh, many bacteria. And that's why we do the metagenomic analysis in the first place so we don't have to isolate these bugs to, uh, to um, identify them. Anyway, this, we, we treat this, in a, this uh, in a review that might be interesting for people. This is, one of, this is one of the challenges as well. How do we associate bacteria to uh, a certain disease? Okay, so we want to go to function next, yeah? So for the functions, what do we do? We sequence not the, uh, only the taxonomic um, uh, marker genes, but we uh, would we like to analyze the whole metagenome, all the functions that are encoded by those uh, bacteria that are there. And um, functions uh, within the metagenomic reads, within the metagenomic sequences, can be inferred by using homology to known genes. And for that, we need reference genomes. So as I said before, there's for, uh, especially 16S RNA, there's a huge uh, database of reference sequences for complete genomes, there's also an, a growing number of reference sequences, and in particular, the, uh, the 700 or 7,000, depending on the size cutoff that you use, um, uh, draft um, metagenomic gene, uh, species genomes that, that came from MetaHit project that, that are about to be published. They're going to be right here. Uh, this is sort of the, uh, the trend that shows you that even for complete metagenomics, the number of reference sequences, the reference genomes, is definitely increasing. Um, and the good thing is, if you work in human and not in weird environments like Jack does, um, the, the situation is actually much better. Because, because of the focus of much of uh, the research worldwide being on humans and human health, the uh, number of reference genomes for human-related uh, organisms, or yeah, related organisms, is, is much higher than for other environments. So I did a little test here where I took metagenomes from uh, like, I don't know, 
I guess the numbers of metagenomes from different environments and try to map them to known um, uh, completely sequenced genomes, the ones in RefSeq, so it's a very small selection of the completely sequenced genomes. And this is the percentage of reads that were mapped to these completely sequenced genomes. And you see that the ones associated to human are, in fact, the uh, second highest uh, fraction of um, reads could be mapped to completed genomes, the ones that came from human. So the, the very highest were the ones from the terrestrial hot spring metagenomes. Basically 100 percent of the reads, or actually 99.98 or something percent of those reads could be mapped to the completed genome, but that they only could be mapped to one, thank you, one, um, uh, one of the genomes here. Uh, so this is basically very high because the diversity is extremely low in that environment. Um, so what you do to uh, 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 analyze these functions, you can, you can build bar charts that say these and these functions are, are present, or you can look at uh, functional uh, profiles like this. Uh, where you say certain functions are uh, in, in the uh, metabolic network are overrepresented or underrepresented. Um, let's see. But there are problems with that. I'll put this slide here, but I'll skip it. Um, and one of the questions that, that we can ask is if we find different functions within an environment, is uh, do they really interact? So we find all these functions in a certain environment. Does that mean that they are actually present in the same organism that, and that this pathway is actually present in this, in this organism that these functions interact? So does this organism exist in that environment? That's the question. So those kind of questions are also part of the challenges that we face when analyzing metagenomic data. Um, so one of the things that uh, I think is, is a way forward is to uh, reconstruct metabolic networks. Um, based on the uh, stoichiometry of known reactions, so you don't have to know all the exact uh, reaction uh, kinetics to build um, metabolic models of, uh, of networks based on stoichiometry. And um, using a, something called flux balance analysis that, uh, that allows you to, um, uh, to analyze and to address uh, the metabolism, even if you don't know all the details uh, of the kinetics. So this is also something that's definitely going to be um, used a lot in, in future research, future analyses of metagenomes. Um, and then finally, the, the third color here, the, the uh, question how can we um, target the bad or the good, specifically target the bad or the good bacteria that we find in our body and help the good ones and kill the bad ones. So um, hopefully uh, Rami, well, Rami is going to say something about phages, probably not about this question. Um, and narrow spectrum antibiotics, of course, the broad scale antibiotics have helped uh, humankind through the, the past decennia, but that bugs are starting to get um, uh, resistant. So narrow spectrum antibiotics might be a way forward. Um, phage, specific phage treatment and pre and probiotics are some buzzwords that I should mention here. Um, can we introduce single species into uh, the human body that might help you. Um, in, in, in practice, we find that it's pretty hard to, uh, uh, to change. So, that, so the, the microbiota, for example, in the gut is pretty stable. You even see these three enterotypes that have been uh, also a result of the Meta-HITS project. You see that people are pretty stable in their uh, microbiota, so introducing uh, single species might be difficult. So I put this little example here of um, fecal transplantation, if you want to introduce a new microbiota into humans, you really have to rinse out everything that was there before, before you can uh, introduce a new microbiota that might be beneficial for this person. Thank you very much.